Good morning, Port City Church. My name is J.P. Dutton. Would you stand to your feet if you're here in person? And for those of you joining us online, welcome. We're here to sing out to King Jesus and make this declaration of faith that through his power, nothing is impossible. Let's stand. Let's sing together. Just one word, you call the storm that surrounds me. Just one word, the darkness has to retreat. Just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Just one touch, my eyes are open to see. I cannot help but believe. It's not a moment that he can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. Just one word, you hear what's broken inside me. Just one word.
grateful hearts and say thank you for all that you've done. Oh, my words fall short. I got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I often do, but every song must end, and you never know. So I threw my King of love had given up 
his life The darkest day in history There on the cross they made for sinners For every curse his blood atones One final breath and it was finished not the end we could have known For the earth began to shake And the veil was torn What sacrifice was made As the heavens roll We say Worshiping with you this morning. 
Good morning and welcome to Port City Church. It's great to see everybody here on this cool, crisp morning that makes you think like maybe we're going to change seasons, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, but we are going to change seasons. In fact, we're going to start the ministry season today here at Port City Church. But what we're first going to do is I'm going to ask the team that's going to collect the offering to come forward and do that. Now, this is an opportunity for all of us to give our first and our best back to God from all that he's given us. But God has given us a lot of opportunities here at this church for ministry, and a lot of times those opportunities start when somebody fills out a Connect card. So if you're new to Port City Church or have just been attending on and off for a while, go ahead and fill out a Connect card, and somebody from our team this week will contact you and talk to you about all the ways that you can get connected into our church body here, and we'll answer any questions you have about the church. So the Connect card, you can fill it out online, or you can just drop it off at the welcome desk after the service. But another way to get connected here at Port City Church is through Discover, which is a, a class. It's four sessions, and what we do is at Discover, it happens on Tuesday nights right out here in the lobby starting September 17. It's every other Tuesday. But what it's a class designed to do is to walk through some real basic truths and basic elements of the Christian faith, as well as explaining some of the key practices like Bible reading and prayer and communion and baptism. So if you're new to following Jesus or maybe new to attending church, sign up for Discover. You can see all the information on our website and register there because we'll, uh, we'll set a seat for you and have some materials for you there. But it starts a week from Tuesday, so make sure that you register soon. But last week, I promised that I was going to bring a special guest with me this week, and I'm going to live into that promise because this is also the start of a new Encounter Youth ministry season, and we're pleased to have our new youth pastor, Ryan Cole, here today to say hi to everybody. So, Ryan, why don't you say hello to everybody and tell us a little bit about yourself. Absolutely. Good morning. It's good to be with you guys this morning. My name is Ryan Cole. I'm the new youth pastor here um, at Port City, and I can already tell this is a special place. Um, I'm so excited to be here. My wife and I, Sarah, Sarah Jane, have been married for a little bit over two years. Um, we have a two-year-old black lab named Sally who is nonstop fun. So um, I'm, I'm initially from um, the Indianapolis area in a suburb on the north side called Carmel. Um, then moved up here um, literally just a few days ago. So um, I'm glad to be here. Um, it's great to be worshiping with you guys this morning. Um, I'm really passionate about youth ministry, obviously, um, but specifically just setting up families to win. Um, one of the things I really believe about youth ministry is when parents win, we win as a church. And so um, I'm really excited about partnering with you um, as parents and then launching Encounter Youth tonight, 6.30 to 8.30. We're having a phone party. Um, and it's going to be a great kickoff to the school year. So I'll be in the lobby after this. I would love to meet you um, and get to know you. Um, excited to be here. There we go. Well, welcome aboard, Ryan. It's so great to have you here. And then I've got another person who feels like a special guest, but he's not because his <laughs> sabbatical season is over. Let's welcome back Pastor Steve. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dave, for holding things down. I mean, he beat cancer. He put a new roof on the building. I mean, he just accomplished quite a bit in these last four weeks. So, um, But it's good to be back with you guys. Thank you for allowing me to be gone for a, a four-week uh, sabbatical. Uh, thank you for your, your generosity, for your gifts. Um, it was just a really good time to be able to kind of relax and, and, and recharge. Uh, not going to lie, it was a little bit odd coming back to the office on Tuesday of this last week. I had to put pants on for the first time in a really long time. And, uh, <laughs> so if I feel a little awkward up here, you know why. I'm used to wearing shorts everywhere. Um, but uh, no, it's, it's really good to be back. Going into the sabbatical, uh, I knew I was a little bit worn out, but quite frankly, I didn't recognize the level that I felt that. Um, so special thanks to the elders and for you guys for, uh, again, recognizing that and allowing me to get away for uh, just a little bit. And uh, it was probably week three of it where I really 
could feel the, the weight of ministry um, that had been on me for a while just kind of lift and uh, it just felt completely different. It was just a, it was a good time away to just spend time with family, get recharged, spend extra time with God. It was just a good time. So thank you so much for that. But I am incredibly excited to be back. My wife is really, really, really excited that I'm back. And uh, it, it's time to, to, to get after it. So today, as Pastor Dave said, we're starting a new series. We're calling this thing A New Way. And I don't know about you guys, but when you look at the world around us, you ever think, man, this place is messed up, right? You just kind of look at, and everybody's mad at each other, aren't they? I mean, you have one group that's yelling at this group, and this group's yelling at this group, and you feel like there's these different agendas, whether it be political or social agendas that are just trying to be rammed down your throat, and you have to either accept it completely or reject it entirely, and as a follower of Jesus, you don't really know what to do or how to, what to say or how to interact and all of those things. So... The good thing is Jesus has a new way, a different way that we're going to be looking at how to engage the world, how to pursue the things that he really wants us to pursue, and how to like leave um, to the side the things that really don't matter all that much. And so we're going to be studying over the next eight weeks, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, and we're going to be studying what is called the greatest sermon of all time. It's not mine. It's Jesus. And we're going to study the Sermon on the Mount for the next eight weeks. So, uh, again, in this season and in this series, uh, Jesus is going to help us really gain some clarity on things that I think are going to be incredibly helpful uh, to us. So, he starts his message in Matthew chapter 5 with something all of us want. Something that all of us pursue, no matter if you're a Christian or if you're not a Christian, it's what we want so badly, and it's called happiness. You guys want to be happy? Who wants to be happy? If you don't want to be happy, there's some medication that will probably help you out a little bit in that, but it's, it's, I'm sorry, I'm just messing with you guys. But we all want to be happy, and we pursue happiness in a lot of different ways, don't we? You know, sometimes people think they can find happiness in their next purchase, it's that nicer car, the nicer house, or you know what's coming out tomorrow, right? iPhone 16. And like, like the newest gadget, and like, oh, if I can just have that in my pocket, I'm going to be great. I'm going to be happy. Some people find happiness, what they think is in their next paycheck. Uh, Zig Ziglar, I think he might have said it best. He said, money won't make you happy, but everybody wants to find that out for themselves. Like, huh? I'll give it a shot, right? You know, some of you look for happiness in the next job or the next great escape, that vacation or some rea- other reality, like you just want to binge watch Netflix all the time. I can just find some happiness there. It's funny, sometimes people think that they can find happiness in that next relationship, right? If I can just find the right person that completes me. Everything is going to be just okay. So us older married people, uh, we look at some of you singles that think, man, all marriage is just going to be everything, everything I ever longed for, and I'll find everything I ever could wish and find happiness in that. And well, uh, be honest, like, marriage is amazing. It, it really is. But, you know, you marry you young singles that think, man, oh, it's just going to be so awesome. We laugh because someday you're going to wake up next to somebody that has, like, the worst morning breath ever or spent all night snoring, or passed some gas underneath the covers, or like all three at once, and you're like, hey, this wasn't supposed to be like this, and you know, it's just a different reality. And that's all me, just so you know, not Sarah. (laughs) But we look for happiness in a lot of different places, and so Jesus, what he's going to do, he's going to start off the Sermon on the Mount by sharing with us, hey, there's this new kind of happiness, a happiness that will last. And so uh, turn with me to Matthew chapter 5, I'm going to start in verse 1 says, seeing the crowds, this is Jesus, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, then he starts with, blessed are the, and then he runs through a number of different, what they call our beatitudes, blessed are the, and so I want to pause just for a moment to talk about what it means to be blessed, because, again, in our culture, our society, we think a lot of different things. You look on social media, right? Uh, it's like it's, it's this couple standing in front of their nice new house, hashtag blessed, right? Or in front of the car, it's like, oh, I'm so blessed. Or you might say, oh, I'm so blessed I got this nice parking spot at the mall, and, you know, right up front and close. But what does it really mean to be blessed? Uh, the, the word blessed, it actually can be translated as happy. Now, if you 
grew up in church, my guess is you were taught the distinction between joy and happiness, right? Joy is concrete and solid and firm, and no matter what happens around you, you can still have joy. But they'll say then that, well, happiness is a little bit different because that happiness, that emotion, is based upon what is happening around you. And that can fluctuate every day or even multiple times throughout the day. And so you need to find joy and not happiness. Well, I hate to break it to you. In the Bible, there's only one word, and it's the word blessed, and it can be translated as blessed and joyful, and happy, and it can really mean flourishing. And so that's really what Jesus wants for all of us. Yeah, we want to pursue happiness, but what does that actually look like? And so here's our big idea from the sermon today. It's this, true happiness is not determined by what happens to me, but what Christ is doing in me and through me. Again, true happiness is not by what's happening all around me, but it's really what Christ is doing in me and then through me. And so Jesus then, after the blessed are, he gives out eight different descriptions of what a blessed life looks like, what a saved like life looks like. And so usually I got like three, maybe four points for you. I got eight today. <clears throat> Let's get after it. All right. Got eight of them today, so please stick with me. The first one, verse two. He opened his mouth, again, as Jesus, and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, what does Jesus mean by, by poor? Because poor doesn't sound like happiness, does it? Poor sounds like you're waking up in the morning eating scrambled eggs and hot dogs for breakfast, macaroni and cheese for lunch and for dinner, some form of hamburger helper. That doesn't, I love scrambled eggs and hot dogs, by the way. If you haven't tried it, give it a shot. It's amazing. Um, but in the Greek, there are really two terms for poor. The first refor, re, refers to those who are struggling financially, who barely have enough money to eat. Today, uh, we call that college students. The second word that's used for poor, it's kind of this interesting Greek word. It's an onomatopoeia, and if you pronounce it correctly, which I'm not even going to try, it makes it sound like you're spitting. So really it means that that kind of poor, it means that you're despised, that you're spit upon, that you are the beggar. So here it says it's poor in spirit. He's not really talking financial wealth here. He's talking about being spiritually bankrupt. It's not that you're just broke. It's that you're broken and you can't do a single thing about it. The Bible calls that humility. It's a state of humbleness, which is kind of that first point. Happy are the humble. The way up is down. So poor in spirit is humility. It means that you know that you have not enough sufficient resources to face life's challenges alone. And when you can admit that and when you can believe that, it changes how you walk through life. In some ways it sounds kind of bad, like I don't have anything, but you recognize at that moment that everything that God has, he can give you to give you what you need to make it through life. Someone once said that God only fills empty hands. And so when you can get to the point where it's like, yeah, I can't do anything except for you, you're in a good spot. That's where it all starts. But we live in a culture and that's always pushed on us. It's not that you want to be poor in spirit. Man, we want to be rich in spirit, right? We want to be like, yeah, I can do this by myself. I want it to be all about me. And like, I want to be poor in spirit? No, I want to be rich in spirit or at least middle class in spirit. Right? I just want to get up there a little bit. But it all starts with this sense of humility where it's like, I can't do anything without God. Because what happens is humility is the basis for all of this. And we'll get into it a little bit later on. But when pride creeps in, it really cuts us off from God's help. And when you live a life of pride, what creeps in is competition and comparison. And when competition and comparison are a part of your life, you're not going to find happiness at all. Um, C.S. Lewis, an author, you, you've probably heard of him before. Um, he said it this way. It's, pride says that it's not that I'm just smart. It's that I am smarter than you. Pride says it's not that I'm just good looking. It's just that I am better looking than you. That's why I love Port City Church so much. There's so many ugly guys here, uh, part of this congregation. I just I feel... Not, not too bad, I, I, I guess, about it. 
But pride, it's all about comparison. It's all about, hey, man, I'm better than this person. I'm better than this person. You start looking down your nose at them and then start competing with each other. And that's just really quite a miserable life. In order to be happy, it has to start you with humility. It's like, God, I can't do anything without you. This is the spot that I'm in. Yeah, I can try, but when I try, I just mess things up worse. But happy are the humble. So the way up is down. Point number two, happy are the sad. Mourning is the way to laughter. Now, some of these are a little counterintuitive. They don't make a whole lot of sense at first, but I'll, I'll explain. In verse four, it says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So how are the sad happy? You know, Jesus isn't talking about mourning over the death of somebody that's close to you. It's not talking about mourning in the sense of because you lost something. He's talking about mourning over our sin. So the Bible gives two different types of warning because, mourning because um, they're just really distinct. Because one can lead you to a really bad place. Mourning on the right side, the biblical side of things, can lead you to a good place. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7 talks about it this way, where Paul says, For godly grief, this is godly mourning, it produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly grief or worldly mourning or worldly sorrow, it produces what? It produces death. You see, worldly grief, what's that about? It, it, it's, it's about all of what happens, again, to you. That you did something, you messed up, you got caught, and everybody now around you knows who you really are. The mask has been torn off, and it's embarrassing. And we, usually when you mess up really badly, you, you might struggle with this a little bit. Do you guys beat yourself up some? You're like, man, I am awful. And then you kind of enter a little bit of a pity party for a while and you try to kick yourself and you, you try to do all this penance and just make yourself feel a little bit better. That type of mourning, it actually leads to death. You're not going to find what you're looking for in that. But there is a godly type of mourning. See, worldly mourning is about you and how you feel. Godly mourning is different because it's how it affects and how your sin impacts your relationship with God. It's no longer you're thinking, oh, man, I messed up. I'm just so awful. I broke God's rules. Now I'm, I'm in time out over here. It's now you're more concerned. It's not because you broke his rules, but because you broke his heart. And it fractured that relationship with him. And as soon as you get to that point where you mourn over your sin because what it does to the one who is perfect, who loves you completely, who gave up his son for you, that's when things really start to change. And it says it's this godly mourning, it leads to what? It re leads to repentance, right? It says, again, the verse says, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. What does that comfort in, uh, being comforted look like? Forgiveness. I mean, look back at your life, at all the things and the ways that you screwed up. There's a lot of things, right? We're all there. Sometimes they're a little bit embarrassing. But God forgave us of those things. When we came to him in humility and we mourned and we repented over things, they've been washed away. The sin's been removed as far as the east is from the west. That's some pretty good news, right? You see how it can lead to happiness. All right, number three, happy are the meek. Strength is found in surrender. Uh, Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the kingdom or inherit the earth. Now, most people think of meekness as a bad thing. I don't know too many people that, that say, my life's goal is to be meek, right? Because we often think that meekness is the same as weakness. I don't know why, maybe because it rhymes. But they're completely different. Meekness, the Greek word, literally means strength under control. The Greek word is used to describe, catch this, a wild stallion that has been tamed. And we all know that wild stallions rule. Does anybody remember that? I just dated myself, right? Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure back in the day. All right, anyway. If you have never watched the movie, don't. It's not worth it. Okay. All right. So anyway, it's power that's under control. The wild stallion, it was powerful when it was wild, but it was also po the same power was there when it was underneath the reins of its master. Okay? You, you, you kind of see where, where this is going. When you are humble, when you mourn over your sin, and when you surrender yourself to God in salvation, what happens? Jesus 
saves us and his spirit, the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of us and gives us all the power that we need for anything. So God's not calling us to be weak here. He's calling us now with the power and the gifts and the talents that he has given to us. We didn't deserve it, right? We didn't earn it. It's not innately because we're awesome. We're humble, right? We're beggars. All those things that he's given us, he wants us to use it how? Under his control. Just like you put the bit in the horse's mouth, that wild sailing to control it, we need to release the reins over to him. And when we can release everything over to him, then he's the one that guides us. He's the one that directs us. He knows, tells us what we need to say, when we need to say it, how we need to say it, how do we interact with this person over here. And that's what really leads to that healthy and flourishing life. You know, another definition you might just use for meekness is really that old phrase, let go and let God. And when you really release the control of your life over to him, that's probably one of the biggest ways that you can have a stress relief in your life because now you can just, it's his. And you're going to have to, it's hard, but you have to be able to trust him in that. And I've learned that a lot in life and in ministry when you just kind of feel like you're overwhelmed and you have so many different decisions to make. Like when I was gone, the new roof that's being put on the facility and you still have the Morgan and you still have these things over here. And like you can freak yourself out by thinking like, I got to figure all this out. And instead, what if we just release it to God? You still do the planning. You still do the praying. You still do the, the preparing. But I'm just, God's got it. We'll be fine. It's no big deal. Let's just keep on following him. The, the reins of this church are his, right? He's going he's gonna to run with it. You do it with family, too. I mean, look at your family and the things that are on in your life, man. You might be feel overwhelmed, but maybe with your kids or with your job or finances and all of that. What if you just release it to God? I had to do that a couple weeks ago. Drop Kate off to college. My oldest daughter at college. I had to let her out of the nest. Fly, little birdie. Fly. That's hard, though, isn't it? You spend all of your kid's life just trying to, like, bring out the best in them, and then all of a sudden they're with all these crazy college guys out there, and they're crazy. And it's like, man, what is she going to do? And how is she going to respond? And how is she going to interact? And you're like, yeah, it's hard, right? But you just got to release. And that's what leads to happiness, though, when you can really trust God, the one who's in control of everything with everything. You know, just let them have it. You know, spend time with them. Let them guide you. Surrender everything before any type of decision's made. You know, so happy are the meek. Next one is happy are the hungry. Hunger leads to satisfaction. This is another weird one because I don't know too many hungry people that are happy. Instead, we have words like hangry. Yeah, that, that's what we think of hungry people. But Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Again, it's what you pursue, what you're after, what you want. And here's kind of the crazy thing. It always sometimes feels like happiness is just around the corner from us. We think, man, if I can just get this over here, then oh, life is going to be good, right? And then you get it, and it's like, oh, okay, maybe it's not all it's cracked up to be. You see this with our kids around Christmas time. They are always asking for that special present, and they're begging for it, and they think it's going to be absolutely amazing, and you give it to them, and they're happy for like a day, and then the toy's in the corner the rest of the time, right? And they don't, it's like, it didn't do anything for them. Uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, they, they call it eternity in our hearts. Um, uh, philosophers will say there's like a God-sized God hole inside of us. And what we try to do is we play that game. If I can just have this, if I can have a house, if I can have a car, if I can have this person over here, if I can have marriage, if I can have a husband that brushes his teeth, if I can have, you know, just this for life, whatever it is, if I can just have that, then life is going to be good. But the problem is none of those things are eternal and we have an eternal void inside of us. And so the only way that we're going to be satisfied is if we get what? Verse 6, it says, blessed are the hungry because they're going to be what? They're going to be satisfied because of righteousness. They're hungry for righteousness. We need God to fill that. So the question is, are you hungry for him? And let's be real, because most of us, we struggle with this one. Are you really hungry for God? Do you, like, wake up in the morning and like, man, I can't wait to be with him. Can't wait to learn about him. Can't wait to study more about him. I can't wait to talk with him throughout the day. Do you really think that? Uh, that's a hard one, isn't it? 
So how do you kind of rekindle that appetite for that? Let me give you four different things here. Uh, the first one is this. Remind yourself how much God loves you. Always go back to the gospel on stuff like this. If you ever wonder, like, man, how do I rekindle this fire for God? Go back to the gospel. Remember, again, you're humble. You're broken. You're a beggar. You're a, a, you know, a child that's distant from God. And yet Jesus came and he saved you. So remember that he loves you. Number two, what you feed grows, what you starve dies. Right? If you're always pursuing after something and you're, you're, you're eating this thing over here that's not really good for you, your appetite for that will grow. But the more that you're in with God and the more that you're studying him, guess what's going to happen with that? It's going to grow too. So pursue him that way, which leads us to number three, get into God's word every day, even if you don't feel like it. I had a pastor uh, growing up. He said, pray when you feel like it. Pray when you don't feel it, like it. Pray until you feel like it. Um, it's the same thing with the word of God. You just got to get in the habit of that. And after a little bit, yeah, a little bit you're going to start feeling good. It's kind of like exercising, which I used to do a long time ago. Um, like the first week is awful. You don't really like it very much. And the second week is like, all right, I'm kind of getting to a habit right there. Third week and fourth week is like, all right, this is my life. I'm digging this. And then you start eating all this kind of like healthy stuff. Um, you know how it is. The same thing is with your relationship with God. Get in uh, to God's word. Enjoy him. Number four, appetite is influenced by association. In other words, you got to surround yourself with the right people. Yeah, you need to be in the world, you know, in your culture, your jobs, interacting with everybody, sharing with them the love of Jesus, but you need the right people around you to encourage you too. That's why we talk about small groups around here. If you don't have that group of people around you, you need to find that group of people around you. They will help you with your appetite for God. So again, what does Jesus say? He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. All right, number five. Still with me? Only halfway done. All right, happy are the merciful. Mercy comes from mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. So the merciful are those who extend forgiveness or generosity in the same amount it's been extended to them. Now, there's a couple of verses that I immediately think about when I hear about God giving us mercy. Uh, the biggest one for me is in Ephesians chapter 2. And so I want to read some of these verses to you. So verse 1, it says, And you were, and there's that bad word, you were dead. Couldn't do anything by yourself, that spiritual beggar. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. And what you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom... We all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature, it says, children of wrath. That means children who deserve wrath like the rest of mankind. Before Jesus, it was hopeless, right? Before Jesus, this is who we were, going after our own thing, our own passions, our own desires. As a result of that, we deserve death. Verse 4 is a great verse, though. Because a lot of times we focus way too much on those first three verses, and we just kind of throw a pity party. We don't need to. We need to own the sin that we've done. We need to recognize the state that we're in, but then we can just embrace the next part. Verse 4, it says, But God, it says, Being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace, you have been saved. You go back to verse 4, it says, but God, he was, what? He was rich in mercy. That's the exact opposite of the poor thing that we talked about before. Poor, you like, you had nothing. Rich, you have more than enough. It says he was rich in mercy. And so when you came to God in humility, repenting for your sins, it wasn't like he gave you just enough mercy so that you didn't have to go to hell. He overwhelmed you with it. I mean, if you have kids, have you ever gone to the pump house down in Grand Haven? Oh, man, it's amazing. You have these little cups that you can fill with, like, ice cream or uh, frozen yogurt or whatever. And then what, what do the kids do after they fill it with that little bit of ice cream? They load it with gummy bears and sprinkles and boba, and you just, yeah, and they just keep it until it just like overwhelms the whole thing where you have more toppings than you do ice cream in it. it that's, a, that's like the picture that I have with God. I mean, like we all need mercy. I mean, lots and lots of mercy. Some of you in the back are like tons of mercy, amen? Okay, uh, 
But what does God do? Rich in mercy, he overwhelms us with it so much that it just kind of flows off of us. It rolls down and affects the people around us too. So if you've received the mercy, what our, what's our responsibility with it? It's going to come out of us. And you don't have to like force it to happen because you're already overwhelmed with it. All right, next one. Six, happy are the holy. Purity starts in the heart. And to be clear on this one, a lot of times when you jump into religion or churches or all that, they talk about purity, and that's really cleaning up all the outside. So you don't say the bad things or do the wrong things. You start with the outward actions. Well, Jesus has a completely new way, a different approach. He's like, it starts in the heart. It does. So Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The pure in heart are those who keep their hearts free from the things that grieve God. What are the things that grieve God? It's, the Bible calls it sin, right? It's impurity, th- impure things. And there are lots of reasons we might avoid sin, but one of the most powerful ones is you want to avoid sin so that you can know God. Now, I'll be clear on this, and it's kind of hard to hear sometimes, but you can't pursue God and pursue sin at the same time. You can't. So if you got some junk in your life that you're like, man, I got this addiction. I got this thing that I have to get after. Let's get you some help for that over there. But you really can't see God, know God, unless you're pursuing God with all that you are. You just got to go after him that way. Because the Bible says if you pursue God, if you're pure in heart, what are you going to do? You're going to see him. And him and his ways and his teachings and his will is going to become a whole lot more clear. I grew up in Midland, other side of the state, and we had this river. It was called the Titabawassee River. Anyone ever been over there? It's gross. I remember like, growing up, we used to dare each other to jump in it. It was like that gross. Like here when you're in the, you know, the big, the lakes, there's clear. You can, it's fun when you can kind of see through the water and you can see fish and rocks down there. Well, in the Titabawassee, if you want like put your head under water um, and you open your, up your eyes, you can see anything. Your eyes probably burned. I mean, you probably lost all eyesight if you were to do that over there. Why? Because it was filled with impurities. The same thing with our lives. If we want to see God, if we want to pursue God, we got to get rid of that impurity that's there. We have to humble ourselves. Like, God, I need some help in this one. I can't do this thing by myself. I'm struggling with this over here. And the more that you kind of get rid of the impurity, guess what happens? What becomes more clear? God, his will, what he wants you to do. And so if you're in that place right now where everything's kind of hazy, you're not really sure, I mean, that's when you get around the right people that can point you to God, you can kind of shed some of those things so that you can see what he wants you to do. And when you follow him in that, that's when things become clear and that's when you become happy and blessed and flourishing. All right, number seven. Happy are the peacemakers. Peace confronts and builds bridges. Number verse nine, it says, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons of God. How many of you guys like to avoid conflict at all costs? Ah, You're gonna hate this one. Okay, you're really not going to like this one. Because there's two parts to this word peacemakers. It's peace and makers. And so you have the peace, the shalom, uh, peace here where everything's good, everything's reconciled and all of that. Then that's the nice part of it. But you're also then called to go and do something with that. So if you're in conflict with somebody else, you know whose responsibility it is for you? Uh, Whose responsibility it is to go and make things right? It's yours. Whether you're the one that screwed up or if they're the one that screwed up. As a peacemaker, you need to go and you confront and handle things the way that God would want you to do. Now, you know you're going to do it the right way if you kind of follow the rest of these beatitudes where you have a humble heart, where you recognize your own sin. Uh, See, peacemakers, they are known for being quick to admit that they did something wrong, right? So you can approach it the right way. Now, the other thing with being a peacemaker is this. is that I mean, that's the horizontal peacemaking, but you also have the vertical side of things, right? At once again, like Ephesians chapter 2 says, that we were children of wrath. There was enmity between us and God. There was conflict between us and God because of our sin, right? And because of Jesus, he brought the peace in. There's a lot of people in our world, there's probably some people here right now too, that you're not right with God. You've been against God. You've never surrendered and gotten his forgiveness. 
You know, that's where we as a church, followers of Jesus, get to have the opportunity to be peacemakers and point them to Jesus, to share our faith, to invite them to church, to do whatever we need to do so that they can experience what we've experienced through Jesus. All right, last one. We did it. Number eight. Happy are the harassed. Expect insults. If you're going to be following God, this is something you can expect. Verse 10, it says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. That does, be clear on this one. You're not being persecuted because you're doing stupid stuff. Don't do stupid stuff. Make sure if you're going to be persecuted, do it about the right things, all right? So blessed are those who persecute, are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And there's a whole lot that we could say about this last one here, but maybe I can summarize it this way. Blessed are those who value being right before God above anything else. In other words, when God calls you to do something, you need to do it. In the way, and in the way in which he's called you to do it. And you don't worry about the consequences that might be there because there's going to be some. Whenever you follow God in any way, whenever you accept the call that he has on your life, um, I hate to say this, but you will be surprised by the number of people that will turn against you. How your family thinks you're doing something absolutely bizarre and crazy. How some of the friends that were close to you, they think, man, you won't do this anymore, and they'll call you different names. You can expect those different types of things when you're following God. But you can be blessed, you can be happy, you can be flourishing in all of those things. Why? Because you know you're close to God. He's met you. You've met him. And life is good. So again, the big idea from today is true happiness is not determined by what happens to me, but what Christ is doing in me and what Christ is doing through me. Now, I just want us to just kind of wrestle with some of these things. This is not like a high pressure thing, but whenever we hear God's word and we study the words of Jesus, we want to make sure that we do something with it. Otherwise, you know, it was just a fun half hour hanging out together, right? What is God calling you into right now? So if you just bow your heads, close your eyes just for a moment. Um, I just want you to wrestle through some of these things. Because there are certain things in this list of what we're kind of supposed to do. We're supposed to be peacemakers. We're supposed to be pure in heart. We're supposed to be merciful. But bottom line is you can't do any of those things unless Jesus rules and reigns in your heart. Unless you have been humble. Unless you've mourned over your sin and repented and said, God, my life is now yours. So I'm wondering if some of you in here today that this all is kind of new to you. You've never given your life to Jesus before and you're like, all right, I, I've tried a lot of different things. I've tried to hide, find happiness in all these different places. I still haven't found it. I still haven't been satisfied. And I wonder if there's anyone that would say, Steve, I, I'm ready to, to give my life to Jesus so that he can meet me, so that he can fully satisfy me. If that's you, I'd love to pray with you for you this morning. If that's you, would you slip your hand up and say, I'm ready to give my life over to Jesus. I'm ready to surrender it completely to him. So if there's anyone in here, would you just raise your hand up and put it back down. If that's you, you just cry out to him right now. You say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I need a savior. I can't do this thing by myself. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to come and live and die in my place. Thank you that he rose again so I can have new life. Now I give my life to him. If that's you, and if you, or if you even have questions about that, I'd encourage you. After the service, stop by the welcome desk out there in the lobby. We want to get you plugged into our Discover class so that you can learn and you can grow in Jesus. And then I just want to close our time by just saying a prayer over you. Uh, if you're like me, you kind of look at these different beatitudes and you think, man, there's some stuff that I need to work on, some things that I need to release over to him. And so I'd encourage you as I pray right now over us, I'd pray, I'd encourage you just go ahead and, and spend some time in prayer with God and releasing those things over to him. Our Heavenly Father, we, we thank you. We thank you for your son, Jesus. Uh, we thank you that he's Savior and Lord and King. Lord, we thank you that even in our complete brokenness, 
you sent him for us. We thank you that because of him and his sacrifice, we can experience this blessed life. So Lord, I pray that these different characteristics of a blessed life, that they'd just be true in our hearts. That we'd be humble. That we'd mourn over the right things. That we'd experience the peace that you have. That we'd be overwhelmed with your mercy. And I pray that we'd just live those things out. So, Lord, I pray that you'd help us. We want to experience you more and more. And as we do that, Lord, I pray that we'd just be the people that you've called us to be and that we'd step into that calling. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand with us for this last song?
were wrestling through a lot of this stuff. There's questions about anything uh, that we talked about, uh, what Jesus was talking about here today. Please don't hesitate to ask. We're all in this journey together. We, we don't have it all figured out. We know the one that does, and we're pursuing him, but you're in a good spot. Uh, if you have questions, don't be embarrassed by anything. Uh, we all got our junk, right? So please stop by the welcome desk, fill out one of those connect cards, talk to one of us afterwards. We want to walk with you uh, together through this life. All right, let's enter time the way that we always do. We're going to say together Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you guys for coming out. You are released to be the people of God.